So a very warm welcome now after this kick-off session and after the opening of the Global Soil Week to our first plenary session. And the session is called Touching Ground. We would now like to come from the high-level presentations from our guests to representatives from different regions of the world who want to tell us what is the impact of soil degradation on their regions, what has to be done, what was already done in the past, and where do we have to start joint efforts. And therefore, I would really like to welcome the panelists and I would like to invite them to come to the podium here. Lindivi Sibanda, from the, she's the executive director of Fan Rapan Food Agriculture Natural Resource Policy Analysis Network from South Africa. Pia, well, <laughs> Pia Puccella, she's the director of a very nice division called Natural Capital from the European Commission. <laughs> I have on my list Cesar Morales. I haven't seen him here. So maybe he will join us a little bit later. Oh, here he is. <laughs> Very warm welcome. Our friend Devolde Ekzeba Hare from Ethiopia. He is the Director General of the Environmental Protection Agency. And last but not least, Professor Ya Yi Yang. He is the president of the International Union of Soil Sciences and he's coming from Korea. <laughs> the title of this session is Touching Ground. And two or three announcements. We now want to listen maybe seven to maximum ten minutes to presentations from all of you. And then we will immediately start after each presentation, a brief session of questions and comments, and then we will go into a broader debate with you in the plenary and also our guests here at the panel. And it's my pleasure to invite Lindive to deliver the first speech. And of course, you don't have to stand during the speech. We have provided seats for you. Lindive, please go ahead. Good morning. Distinguished participants, I have heard you being addressed as friends, so I will do the same. I think we are lucky out of a population of uh, over 7 billion to be the chosen 500 to be here today to understand the nexus, to learn together how to manage the nexus, to create solutions, and to deepen our dialogue. And I take a cue from what Professor Tofa said, that we are not here to identify what we need to do further in terms of research, but we are here to dialogue for solutions. In dialoguing for solutions, I want to know who is your constituency? Who gives you the mandate, the legitimacy to be here? And where are you going to take these messages to? For one, I am here to let you know that I will be touching ground with my roots because every Christmas time I spend three weeks in my village, the village where I was born in Zimbabwe, in Loa Gweru, where I am a product of tomato farming. Being a product of tomato farming, we had various assets but now I realize the most important was the soil. We, unlike what many people believe, had the opportunity with all the other community members to have three arable areas. We had the homestead. I'm taking you to my roots now. We had the homestead on a one hectare plot together with other families where we grew our vegetables because we had a hand pump and a well where we could draw water for domestic consumption. And every morning, we'd have to water the tomatoes, water the vegetables that we use for our everyday food. In the dry season, that was the plot that gave us green millies in our one hectare residential plot. We also had a quarter of an acre in an irrigation plot. This was mainly allocated to women. 200 women farmers in the village all had a quarter of an acre where we could do all, all year-round farming. There we grew produce for the market. 
tomatoes were grown, we had green beans as well, and we had green mealies, which we sold as fresh. In addition, we had a third plot, which was two hectares, totally devoted to dryland farming of our staple maize. We also had grandmother's crops, which were the beans, and uh, other legumes, which we just scattered, and sorghum, which was the sweet sorghum, which we enjoyed, which we scattered during the rainy season, broadcast through planting, no fertilizer applied, and we harvested and enjoyed the season. But the best part was when we went back to school, which was in town, we would carry enough supplies for at least three months. Harvest was in April, and it meant that June, July, August, September were bounty months of good variety of food. This, ladies and gentlemen, is 40 years ago. I hope you've done your maths to calculate my age. Today, I am supposed to be the one who takes my own children to the village to do the cultivation over the holidays. They tell me, no ways, mom, we're not going there. <laughs> Why? Because the people who live there are very poor. We have to send food, monthly remittances, to the people in the village. My grandmother is passed, my grandfather is passed. We've had to scrounge for people who can just safeguard that household. We look for extended cousins, for family relations who have no homes, who just want to go and look after that home. These are the new farmers in Southern Africa. We have an aged population of farmers because the youth no longer want to be there. Why? Because what you put on the ground, you harvest one third of what we got 40 years ago. The soil is no longer yielding, and the question is why. What is interesting is that we used to buy just one bag, 50 kilograms of fertilizer to take to my grandmother. She had her four oxen drawn on a cart where she would collect manure from her crawl and fertilize the soil. But all those assets have been sold because poor harvest means little income. It means you have to meet your daily needs through other livelihood means and disposal of assets has become a way of life. Now, people on the soil, and we heard this morning that the soil is one of the few assets that the poor earn. Who is going to re-energize the soil? Who is going to revitalize the soil? What will it take? Unfortunately, we have not done enough research locally to document what it takes economically to revitalize these soils but the challenge still remains. Whose responsibility is this? As we engage from losing ground to touching ground, I want you to keep the picture of my village, Loa Gueru, whereby the irrigation plots are now dry. The river that was feeding the dam is choked with soil due to erosion. The trees have been removed because that has been our only source of firewood. Every fri Friday, we carried a load of firewood so that we could have a happy feast every weekend of good food that is cooked. We now buy firewood. People are still cutting trees, but they are so few that we can no longer go out and harvest. As women, we rely on those with transport to carry to the village. In terms of water, the well that was dug in my own homestead has gone dry. We now get water from our neighbors. Water, soil, energy. How do we need the meat of the people who are on the ground? How do we get the youth to go back to the rural areas and be the farmers of the future? How do we make Mother Earth feed the world in a growing population? This is the challenge and I hope in the coming days you will equip me with messages that will allow me to be knowledgeable as I engage during my Christmas festivities with my community in Loa Gueru that there is hope that there are answers and that there is commitment at national level through the policies that are evidence-based, at global level through the sustainable development goals that talk about all of us, not just the poor, but all of us who are affected by global challenges that we can make the village I come from a better place. I thank you.
Thank, thank you very much, Lingive, for sharing your personal experiences and, and demonstrating the world is already losing ground, but the impact of losing ground is not, it's not abstract, it's very concrete. It's the families, these are the poor people, and the question is, how do we have to act jointly in order to assure that the poorest people are not suffering the first and suffering the most from losing ground? Now, I would like to open immediately the floor. Are there comments or are there questions related to what Lindive has presented? And are there any proposals? What do we have to do? And I already see the first one. Ratan Lal, I don't have to introduce you. I think everybody knows you as a soil scientist. Please take the floor. And here's a microphone for you that we can all hear. Thank you. Hear. That was uh, very nice, very excellent. Could you tell us what can be done to reverse the trend of deforestation and choking the rivers and wells dry? Is there okay. another question or another comment? There's another one. There's another one. And of course, it was a very easy question, what can be done, Ratan? <laughs> you mentioned that uh, after 40 years, it has been realized that the land cannot provide what it pro had provided before. Now, are the um, users of the land, your family, uh, did they, uh, were they aware of the practices that led to this, uh, to this loss? or they thought that this is something uh, natural, or it was due to climate change, or did they attribute it to the use, or to policies that determine the use? And there are two more questions, okay. one here on the right side, and the next is here. And then Lindive is going to answer, and then we are listening to our next speaker. Thanks for pointing out the consequence of losing ground and losing soil fertility of losing young farmers. I think this is one of the most tragic consequences, not only in Africa, it's here. Look at our average age in Europe of our farmers. I come from the organic movement. I have seen that young people see the potential of organic farming and I have seen young farmers, and you can see it also all over the world, that they go back to farming because they see the potential and the hope of organic farming. Maybe you can comment on this. And now, the last question related to this presentation. Yes, I have a question on the number of people relying on this plot of land uh, 40 years ago and now, and maybe in between, and whether you envisage that to be a factor in um, um, losing the fertility of the soil. So how many people rel uh, were relying on the food of that plot of land then and now? Thank you. I think just to explain that the story I told is documented in a magazine that we've got, so we're going to put this at the back there, because we believe these are stories that are, they don't get to the high levels where we make decisions. So we've initiated a magazine called AgriDeal, the fun pan organization I work with, where we go out to the communities and get them to document their life stories. What are the challenges? So some of the answers that I'll share are drawn from uh, this publication and the story I told is on page 108. What can be done to reverse deforestation? I think the challenge we've had with development is that there was an era where governments did things for the people without involving the people. We would come up with solutions, large dams, irrigation, plots, and we all go and farm. At the time, 40 years ago, I remember there were extension services that were very functional. So we relied a lot on the extension service agent who was allocated to a specified number of villagers. So there was that Farmer of the Year Award, there was the Master Farmer Program, where farmers were trained, they understood. But if I zero in particularly on the issue of Zimbabwe, there was an era during the war where everything that we had been taught was reversed. I, distinctly remember the era where we did conservation agriculture, we used to dig holes, but during the liberation struggle we were told, that's colonial mind, don't do those things. You, 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 you just go back to your traditional farming, that's what is good. So I think the mix, mismatch in messaging and not allowing local scientists to own the message and take it to the farmer did create some confusion. Now, what can be done to reverse the deforestation? 
the quick solution for the irrigation scheme I've talked about was that a group of private sector people from the area decided to remove the silt from the dam and this year for the first time the farmers are able to go back but that's not a solution it is the haphazard settlement of people it is the cutting down of trees that has caused the soil erosion now this is embedded deep in governance issues but governance is really bottom up the people being governed have to understand why they have to understand the science and i think unless we promote more barefoot universities where we take the knowledge from the shelf to the people and get the people to inform policy processes we will be troubleshooting desilting dams revitalizing irrigation streams 20 years later we have the same problem if not sooner so i think community education and we need to find new ways of doing it radio cell phone other ways so that people own the development agenda now i think i've partly covered what are the practices that have led to this uh, deforestation haphazard settlement of people and the increase in population people now and breakdown of law and order where people just decide through maybe bribing the local chief to settle anyway before it was orderly and there were days we were allowed to collect water days we could harvest firewood and designated areas for that and there were tree planting initiatives and all that has broken down now losing young farmers that's a subject that's very close to my heart my own organization we've been talking to young people and saying what is it about agriculture that has lost its uh, face and they are clear they want to go they want to do farming they want to engage in the value chain the bottom line is it's got to be profitable and what they still don't get is why is a commercial large scale farmer making money and yet a smallholder farmer can so we need a new paradigm and i'm happy that um, under the un organizations and ambassador is here who was championing the cause we're looking for a new paradigm for smallholder farmers there is no way we can jump the rider to industrialization without improving our farming and making it attractive to the new generation but we have to modernize it we have to make sure the inputs market and the output markets are functioning and we make to make sure that the natural resource base is respected revitalized and energized to yield and all those are things that need to be put not just one solution but a holistic approach then finally how many farmers how many families are impacted by all these problems i think i spoke of my life in the village my grandmother had eight children it meant every holiday we were 40 of us going back to her just to help her as free labor during the school holidays but each one of us were able to get supplies for three months which is eight families getting three months supply of food now we have to send remittances to, to just keep that one family there to survive because the harvest they get does not suffice for more than a month or two. So you can imagine with the poor wages in town, with everybody moving into towns, that's where the poverty now is encroaching. It's now higher in towns because of the mass immigration from rural to urban. But we need to reverse that. We need to get more people to the land and we can only do that if the land is yielding enough livelihood to sustain the people. So that's the challenge. So the imperative is to go back to the natural resource base, revitalize our soils, make sure the water is available, and make sure the energy is affordable. Then people will have a dignified lifestyle in rural areas. Thank you. Thank you very much. And on our journey around the world, we now would like to touch ground again here in Europe, and we've heard in the speech of the European Commissioner for the Environment, Janis Protochnik, that also Europe has a problem with its soils, and very good news, the soil directive is not yet dead. It depends on our activities to really implement it. It's my pleasure to welcome Pia Puccella here and to give a presentation on the situation in Europe. Thank you. So, <laughs> thank you. I, I want to look at how we are losing ground, because unfortunately we are losing ground inside Europe, inside the European Union. 
from a slightly different perspective. And since Professor Töpfer in his introductory speech put so much weight on this institute which has organized and which hosts this uh, Soil Week, which is an institute dedicated to studying elements, I would want to start also with some studies which our own institute inside the European Commission carries out, which is our joint research center. In very recently, our joint research center has put forward a soil state of soil in Europe 2012, the results of a study. What is this uh, report telling us? That 1.3 million of square kilometers inside Europe are affected by soil erosion. And that almost 20% of this 1.3 million square kilometers lose more than 10 tons of soil per hectare every year. If we consider that what is considered as a sustainable, as an acceptable, as a renewable possibility of losing soil in terms of soil per hectare is no more than two tons per year, that we simply think that we can afford losing more than 10 tons per hectare a year shows already that inside our system, our European system, we are not thinking in the right way. There are, moreover, some 3 million contaminated, potentially contaminated sites in Europe. We don't have the exact numbers, again, and I will come to it at the very end, because we do not have, as of yet, proper soil legislation in Europe. But these 3 million contaminated sites are sites which today, because we consider them contaminated or potentially contaminated, we do not use. So they are lost, and instead of using those sites, we are simply grabbing new land, we are simply sealing new land for our urban development, and what is worth, we are using land in third countries, because at the end of the day, if we in the European Union consider that soil is such an important issue for each of our governments, for each of our national systems, that it is very difficult for all of us to accept to introduce legislation which would bind all of our national systems to some elements common for all of us and which we all would commit to respect. How can we afford to grab land, to use land, which is not in our national system, which is in other countries, because we do import land each and every year to an even greater extent. But let me come back to those contaminated sites. These are former industrial sites, our brownfields, and these cover an important part of our land in Europe. For the time being, we are simply considering that decontaminating those sites, that rehabilitating those sites, is an expensive issue. Yet, 
it is not, and by far not, as expensive as using new soil for our urban development, for building our new industrial sites. These brown fields are very often close already to urban areas, and because they were former industrial sites, are very well connected to those urban areas. Therefore, if we were to invest in decontaminating, in rehabilitating our brownfield sites, we would, at the end of the day, make big savings, big savings in terms of not using agriculture soil, of not using land which is still available for biodiversity, for agriculture, for feeding us at the end of the day. And we would not need to invest as heavily in new transport infrastructure. We would create a profit for our climate and we would have a real net benefit but so far we have not invested in researching and in establishing proper indicators which show us what are the benefits and what are the costs of our present behavior. We have calculated and these are calculations provided by the various governments, that in Saxony alone, in one German land, brownfield sites cover some 920 square kilometers. In France, the Environment Agency has calculated that contaminated urban areas in France cover some 1,000 square kilometers. In England and Wales, where up to now, because now the system has changed, there was one environment agency for these two parts of the United Kingdom. This environment agency has calculated that contaminated sites cover some 3,000 square kilometers of England and Wales and represent some 2% of their whole area. This gives you an idea of how big these contaminated sites are, how much we could gain by providing uh, rehabilitation of these sites. We want, between now and 2050, be able to feed some 9 billion of human beings on this planet. Yet, we are losing ground every year, which allows to provide bread for the whole of Germany every year. And we want to be able to feed in 30 years' time, so many more inhabitants of the planet. How could we do this if we don't do a paradigm change? If we don't change our habits, if we don't change our traditions? So far, what I wanted to say, just one word on this uh, soil legislation. Inside the European Union, we have established legislation in the field of environment on all our main elements which are of concern to the environment. We have legislation on air, we have legislation on water, we have legislation on nature and biodiversity, yet we do not have up to today, legislation on soil. Thank you.
thank you very much, Pia, for presenting this very precise and clear picture about the situation in Europe. Europe is losing ground, and thank you for introducing contamination as one of the big issues. Pollution, contamination, which has a huge impact on the availability of soils. Same procedure. Who wants to raise questions? Who wants to provide a comment on everything Pia has mentioned in her presentation? Here we have two people, two, f two good friends. And, uh, and maybe I have forgotten it. Maybe you could introduce yourself five seconds, your name and where you are coming from, so that we know who is talking to, to us. Yaya, please start with it. Yaya Olaniro, the Nigerian permanent representative to UN based agencies in Rome. Thank you, madam. Contaminated sites. May I suggest that there may be need to look at the issue of carbon credit and do something very simple. Encourage people in the environment to plant trees and then they get some either money or voucher for that. Secondly, there's also the need to let everyone realize that all the legislations you have, they are in the sky. Unless they link it up with the soil, they are not going to actually succeed. And I think that is something that is very critical. And we, in this meeting, should be able to take some recommendation out. Thank you. Thank you, and please, your direct neighbor. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Julia Satoping. I'm from Botswana. It's somewhere there in southern Africa. I have three very quick ones. Uh, the first one is the model of cities, or if you like, the model of urbanization, that we are in an urbanizing world. Um, I'm not too sure what kind of um, best practices or advice you can give to those which are still developing so that we don't have this problem of contamination. I hope it's clear, yeah, the, the sort of like, is it legislation, is it what, you know, uh, some kind of advice. The second one is about feeding the world or feeding the population along the lines of sustainable development, those uh, pillars of sustainability. Do we have something like a peak based on soil productivity to say this soil can feed so many people now and in the next 50 years it will still do the same? You know, starting modeling along those lines, as we have done with climate change, blah, blah. We left out soils. Maybe it's time we, <clears throat> we kind of did the same, I think. Uh, the last one is looking at soil as a natural capital. We haven't really done a lot along that line, you know. It's just as a natural capital, you know, rather than the economics of it, so forth, you know, it's intrinsic natural value, how it's adding to the whole well-being and so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. There's one more question directly here in the corner. The microphone is coming. And now we have a new rule. There's only two questions allowed when you ask for the floor. Thank you very much. I'll only ask one question. Ken Irvin from UNESCO uh, Institute of Water Education. I'm interested in, uh, in, in, in the view uh, of the EU uh, and the Commission in terms of the reform of the common agricultural policy and to what extent soil integrity has been a, a major uh, thematic uh, consideration and what the outcomes of that will be. Thank you. Pia, the floor is yours. Yeah. Uh, this was a very small question, the common agricultural <laughs> policy is in, in two yes. minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Alexander. Well, contaminated sites, what to do about contaminated sites? Uh, planting trees is, of course, one element for moving contaminated sites towards non-contaminated sites. The objective must be to rehabilitate the sites, to rehabilitate the sites to such an extent that you could then plant trees, but you could also grow food. You could provide safe places for our children to play. Nowadays, on a contaminated site, you don't want your children to go playing 
because they are dangerous. They are a health issue. Contaminated sites must be, in the first place, rehabilitated. To the second question, on advice on development of cities. Well, I think that it was Professor Töpfer who mentioned that a big country, and a big country which has a very solid soil legislation at national level already. A big country like Germany is decreasing in terms of population, yet is increasing in terms of using new land for inhabitants for its population. There, I, I think that we need to make sure that our policy decision makers take the right decision. We do have urban planning obligations in Europe and for what matters, in most of our big urban developments around the world. This is where you need to take policy decisions. Then <clears throat> soil, of course, soil is natural capital. Soil is part of our main environment, yet it is also true that soil is not studied to the same level, that soil is not considered as important as other parts of our natural capital, as water, for instance. We have far more knowledge concerning water, far more legislation concerning water, and this is very important and very good that we have it, but we need to develop it on soil. I would want to mention the last question on the new reform of the common agriculture policy. The reform of the common agriculture policy allows a lot of improvement in terms of using our land for agriculture in a better way, in terms of decreasing monoculture in terms of increasing grassland. Yes, our reform of the agriculture policy has given a far bigger flexibility to member states to make their own decision. As much as before the agriculture policy was establishing a very clear obligation in terms of receiving funding, but providing some specific outputs, as much now the possibilities for uh, an environmentally sound agriculture system are all in place, but there is a big flexibility left to member states to shift from second pillar, which by definition is more environmentally friendly, to first pillar, to, to shift from uh, some uh, more stringent environmental obligation to less stringent environmental obligation. We will see, and I think on that we can touch bases at least in five years' time to see what has come out of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pia. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you our next speaker, Cesar Morales, from the Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean. And he will provide, again, a different perspective, because this is the idea behind this Global Soil Week, to bring people from different regions with different scientific backgrounds, with engagement in civil society from government and private sector together in order to address one issue. And I think we will learn a lot now from your experience from Latin America. Thank you very much. Well, first of all, I would like to express my gratitude to the organizers for the opportunity to share our experience and insights. 
Um, I have prepared a presentation. Thank you. Well, some uh, general figures, such a background. Uh, 2.6 million or living billions of people are living in affected areas in the world. In Latin America, the figures uh, are quite um, similar in terms of proportions. Um, the gross value product in not affected areas, it's bigger than the affected areas. In terms of biodiversity and food, as you know, Latin American countries has a very important biodiversity uh, figures. And the, um, in terms of climate change, agriculture and land use changes causes approximately around one third of the emission gas, greenhouse gases. But in Latin American countries, it's higher because agriculture and land use, it's quite important than other parts of the world, probably. Well, threats to rural soils, overgrazing, organic nutrients, insufficiency of soil degradation, erosion, and compaction. The expansion of cultivated soils and natural vegetation, uh, the decreases of the cover forest mainly. The irrigation, 20% of the irrigated area, is affected by salinity. The over-exploitation and inefficient use of water resources, that's quite important in Latin American countries. And pasture land, 73% the area is affected by land degradation. Reviewing and focusing in the question that I received, what is the situation in terms of land degradation in Latin America? If we examine uh, the um, action plans to combat the certification, we can find that we have different figures because we are measuring different things. I prepared for a table, three tables to show the situation in each country. In summarizing, the most important in terms of affected areas are Argentina, Brazil, Mexico, mainly, okay? But the figures doesn't uh, show exactly the situation because we are measuring different things. For instance, in some cases, such as Brazil, we're measuring exactly only land desertification. In other countries, we're measuring land degradation. That is bigger concept than land desertification. So, some time can appear that, such as Brazil, only 12% of area affected. In fact, it's much more bigger if we consider land degradation too. But some other countries doesn't have uh, information. But the main uh, conclusion, it is that we don't have the same concepts in order to measure the, uh, the affected area. And some countries, we don't have nothing such as Guyana, for example. We don't have nothing for uh, Honduras and Guatemala, too. Yeah. Well, sustainable land uh, management and natural resources. In Latin America, we have a lot, lot of knowledge, mainly traditional knowledge, and experiences at different levels, but the common characteristics is that they are, they are fragmented and dispersed. Public policies, when exist, generally are not evaluated. We need to know the knowledge regarding successful and unsuccessful experience because are fragmented and dispersed. When exist, uh, they are not shared, uh, neither internally nor between countries. The paradox is the following. Latin American country has an enormous capacity for generating the scientific knowledge. A large number of scientists in these areas. I would like to show an example. For example, Brazil. One institution, Embrapa. Embrapa is the institution in charge of the research in the agricultural development. You are from Brazil? Okay, Embrapa, exactly. Well. If I'm not wrong, Embrapa has, if I'm not wrong, 
12,000 uh, people with PhD. Yeah. It's a large quantity. Well, Argentina has in this institution uh, similar figures too. Well, we have a, lot, a large number of scientists and enormous wealth of traditional knowledge. Yes. Some valuable experience in public policy. We have strong institutions too. But much of this is invisible. The, there is a disconnection between the science and public policies and between those who are working in these areas and those involved in the economy. There is a big gap between scientific research and the requirement of affected communities. For few people know what has been done even among research centers and scientists. The main characteristics is the disconnection between scientists uh, inside the countries and between countries. But the world is between inside the institutions too. Yeah. <clears throat> Why Latin American countries are increasing their agricultural export deforestation as a rate significantly. significantly. Uh, I would like to show one example uh, shortly. The star product in terms of export of Latin America, right now it's soybean, okay, for the external market. And in terms of growth, it's cattle production too, for the internal market. Well, to expand the production of the soybean, we have destroyed a lot of forest. In the last 15 years, we have, we have deforested around 80 million hectares. The main part, it's located in Brazil. But it's not only Brazil, okay? But if you compare the cost of one hectare of deforested area against one hectare producing, producing soybean and cattle, we can conclude that the cost is higher, much higher than the successful that we have uh, done with the export of soybean. Okay. The problem is that the market prices doesn't reflect exactly the uh, necessary, the medium and long term scarcities. That is an example. Um, in terms of market value, uh, we, 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 we can make a lot of uh, mistakes if we take into account only market prices. Even that, yeah, from the, uh, in terms of the sustainable land management, it's quite important to take into account what is uh, being done right now. For the public uh, sector, we have a lot of experience in terms of sustainable land management, finance, gender perspective, ecological services, research, water basin, conservation, property rights. Um, from the side, of the ONGs, we have a lot of experiences too. But our conclusion, uh, our message is the following. First, um, we need to take into account the importance of public policies because market price give uh, signals that can lead to destruction of nature. Yeah. We can include the private sector but in terms of a framework of regulation, taking into account public policies. Uh, it's quite important to know about the traditional knowledge, to have a bank of experiences, bad experiences and good experiences, uh, to, to take into account the financial resources, the capacity building in terms of public policies, but to take into account that it's not enough to have financial resources because we can make misaction too that can cause much more than the problem that we are trying to solve. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for providing a lot of food for thought and for discussion, of course. And I think everybody agrees that we need better data, that we need a coherent definition so that we can compare what is happening across the world. But some of your other presentations, I think, will be highly controversial here. And I've seen already the first fingers going up and there will be two or three people allowed 
to support you or to raise questions or to provide comments. Please, here in the first row. You made a very interesting remark that there is a disconnection between scientists and politicians. And my question is why it is the case in Latin America? Is it uh, as uh, the scientists are in the ivory tower? Are they too segregated? Don't they understand the context? Or are the politicians not willing to listen to the scientists as they are perhaps have a hidden political agenda? Tell me what is the background here? In order to provide a little bit more time for you for thinking about the answer, is there anybody else who wants to take the floor here? There are two questions. And please Thank introduce you. yourself yeah. for a second. I'm Maria Giraudo from Argentina, from the Argentinian No-Till Farmers Association. I wanted to ask you about the origin of this data. data. And for in, on the other hand, uh, that uh, South America has the higher adoption of no-till systems based on um, sustainable agriculture production. And well, uh, I wanted to, to tell that point. And we have a, a very nice vinculation between farmers and scientists, technicians. Thanks. My name is Rafael Fuentes. I am a scientist from a public institute of agricultural research and also participate in no tube farmers. Uh, Brazilian no till Farmers Federation. Uh, I think you forgot to say uh, something, because, for instance, in Brazil, we have uh, soil policies and soil laws about soil uh, conservation and, and maintaining in 15 out of 27 states in Brazil. Uh, we have more or less 25 million hectares of no-till system that generate more or less food for 15% of global population. We have maybe the, the strongest uh, agroecological and organic farming movement in Latin America. Mm. Then you forgot some, some details and synergic uh, situations that occur in the last 20 years. Maybe we are accustomed to, to make linkages between scientists, extension, and farmers, maybe in 75% of our agriculture. Mm -hmm. The deforestation uh, process in Brazil is near the Amazon region, the agricultural uh, Intensification is in southern and in Savannah. Mm -hmm. Then I, I had to make this clarification. Thanks a lot. And of course, we are happy to have someone here from Embrapa. And you mentioned Embrapa, and therefore, Maria, yeah. you have to take the floor. Hello, I'm Maria de Lourdes Mendonça from Brazil and from Embrapa. I'm a soil scientist. And uh, I'm going in the same direction of the colleague Rafael because I think in your talk that it's very important to look behind and to see the passive you have done uh, with the development of agriculture. But nowadays, I think we have a good, of, uh, good examples that it has been uh, copied by many other countries, even Latin America and else in Africa and other uh, countries. That's about uh, no tillage cultivation. It's about the integration of grassland cultivation forestry. That is very important. I have, we have very good example on that. Also about uh, environmental services. I think all the results at Embrapa at these days and also our partners in Brazil are looking for the sustainability on agriculture. That is, I think, is the change you might do in terms of paradigm you know, in agriculture. I was surprised that in Europe you don't have something more strong for soil. I hope that could be a good example because of many countries follow this legislation. And I think with the 
code forestal in Brazil, you are also going this direction of protection. So we have to look behind the problem, but look ahead, look in front to solve that. Thank you. Now three minutes for, okay. again, looking okay. ahead for you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, Latin America is a very, very, very heterogeneous region, first. Each country, such as Brazil, is quite heterogeneous also. Inside Brazil, you can find almost all kinds of experiences. Even that, Argentina is a very heterogeneous region. If you compare the Pampa region against the other province, you can find very different situations. Yeah. Even that, probably the situation in Brazil and Argentina are the best situation in Latin America. Yeah? We have uh, uh, finalized two months ago a conference in Sobral, in the north of Brazil, about exactly uh, this uh, issue. An encounter of the scientists from Brazil mainly, not only Brazil, but participating from different countries, even Argentina, for instance, and other countries, but exactly about this issue, okay? That is true that I have mentioned it. But even that, we have a lot of problems between connections, sci uh, between scientists, um, policymakers. Probably the message that we are giving to the policymakers are not always the best message. In Brazil, they have a lot of advances in terms, because each state has a, a specific plan to combat desertification. In Argentina, you have more or less the same situation too. But in other countries, such as Paraguay, for example, Paraguay recognized only five years ago that has problems in terms of land degradation. Even that is a country that has the highest rate of deforestation in Latin America. Yeah? We have a lot, lot of different situations, but the problem is we need to improve the connection between, between scientists and policymakers and producers. Uh, you have mentioned in the case of Argentina, in my opinion, it's a very nice connection between the scientist side with producers, but mainly focalized in the Pampa region. I'm not quite sure if it is the same situation outside in the extra Pampian economies, but could be much better than other countries. Uh, one last example, Costa Rica, for example, has a lot of information, but a very big disconnection between scientists, producers, and policymakers. Okay? That is it. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much. Now I would like to invite our friend Tevolde to take the floor. He's coming from Ethiopia. Ethiopia, a country who is really facing huge challenges. If we look ahead in the year 2050, we know that the population of Ethiopia will increase from today around 85 to 90 million to an estimated 180 million. So additional 90 to 100 million people will live in 2050 in Ethiopia. Tivolde, how are you going to deal with it? What are your experiences and what has to be done at the global level in order to ensure food security for everybody there? Apologies, Tivolde. We learned that we need to work together. And I would like to be a little bit cozy so that you don't get uh. disconnected. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to start by stating that I am honored to be a member of this panel. I thank Professor Töpfer and his work colleagues not only for the honor given to me, but even much more so for the attention that they are ensuring the world to give to the soil, which I believe is as fragile as myself. <laughs> I took my PhD program in plant ecology in the United Kingdom between 1966 and 1969. The two exciting new ideas of food production of the time were the boosting of soil fertility in the short run 
with nitrogenous chemical fertilizers that the end of the Second World War had optimistically made unnecessary as explosives for our destruction and in the long run with hydroponics that was going to make the soil absolutely unnecessary except as our graveyard. Now, more than 40 years later, we still abuse chemical fertilizers to the point where the soil structure is being lost and our graves are becoming harder to dig up and still pollute the atmosphere with greenhouse gases to intensify water scarcity that it has become an additional factor in triggering wars and thus in our continuing use of nitrogens, chem nitrogenous chemicals and other explosives to kill one another. No doubt, many new exciting ideas that defeat our immediate attention and distract it from ecosystem-wide maximization of soil health and nutrient cycling keep coming up all the time. In the meantime, we are losing our abused soil through erosion of a, at a global average of about 16 times the rate through which it is created from weathering from its subsoil. In mountainous areas like my country, the rate is 300 times or even greater. Fortunately, farming communities can organize themselves and carry out ecological agriculture, which bolsters the needed soil protection measures to minimize soil erosion, while at the same time maximizing soil health and nutrient cycling. Will ecological agriculture really enable us to do that? The question posed by Alexander Muller is appropriate in mountainous Ethiopia. And my answer is definitely yes. Why do I say so? It is yes only if we take ecological agriculture seriously and do all the necessary research and development as well as management to bolster rather than shunt the natural cycles that improve the functioning of the ecosystem as a whole, including those parts of the earth that are not cultivated like the oceans. Can we manage this complex phenomenon that we call ecological agriculture? Why not? Previous farming communities have been doing so for thousands of years. With our increased scientific knowledge, we should do better than they had done we have much more scientific information. We are doing it in mountains in Ethiopia, a least developed country. This means to me that it can be done throughout Africa and the world beyond. However, national policies and technical support to empower the local farming communities so that they take unanimously agreed collective actions are essential. 
we have managed to do so, to do these things in Ethiopia. We started providing the needed empowerment with some and then with virtu virtually all farming communities in Tigray, the region in northern Ethiopia, then in Amhara, the region just south of it, but both in northern Ethiopia. And we started with northern Ethiopia because that, was, that has been the most degraded part of the country. We are now expanding the experience to the rest of Ethiopia as a whole. The first communities started working with us on degraded lands. They carried out physical soil erosion control activities, including terracing, check dams, across gullies and trench bands. They restricted free-range animal grazing to small areas and cut and carried grass and other leaves to feed their animals. Trees and grass cover then returned fully to the land. Obviously, biodiversity conservation and carbon sequestration also increased. The rest of uh, rain, the, sorry, the rate of rainwater um, conservation, the rainwater infiltration increased, biodiversity conservation and carbon sequestration increased. Um, these, the reduction of water scarcity in the um, dry season also improved greatly. This was all traditional to the farming communities, but the breakdown of their local community organizations had prevented them from acting collectively to use what they knew worked. <clears throat> we reversed, we helped them reverse that. We encouraged them to revive their community organizations which had been lost when our late feudal environment um, s uh, strengthened its uh, governance and in so doing destroyed local governance, not deliberately, but simply to withstand colonialism and the disintegration that local organizations could have caused. They agreed to set of, to, uh, they agreed to a set of bylaws to enable them to do the reversal of the land degradation. We obtained recognition of those bylaws by their district government. We trained the extension agents and some of the farmers on how to prepare and use compost, which was new to them, introduced from India. And the whole local farming community got on with it. Their productivity per unit area for barley, durum wheat, finger millet, maize, sorghum, teff, and a mixture of barley and, uh, and durum wheat increased by an average of about a third because of this. <clears throat> Latterly, we have introduced to them transplanting their long season crops like finger millet, sorghum, maize to ensure a long enough growing season even when the rainy, even when the rainy season becomes short. And the rainy seasons are getting erratic owing to climate change, as you all know. This transplanting ensures sufficient spacing among each individual crop plant. Even when the growing season started early enough 
and careful sowing ensured sufficient spacing among individual crop plants. The resulting crop growth was really very encouraging. The consequent measured spacing minimized competition and increased yields by about another third. This sustainability would, however, no doubt be undermined by a continuing exponential population growth, as rightly pointed out by Alexander Miller earlier, however. Also in this respect, our tendency is encouraging. Ethiopia's population growth rate has started to fall. It was 2.9% per year during the 1994 census, and it went down to 2.6 per year during the 2007 census. The next census is very near soon. I'm pretty certain it will go further down. This fall is because access to voluntary birth control measures and overall health care have been growing fast in the last 10 years or so. Nevertheless, it will be only when the human population size has stabilized in Ethiopia, in Africa as a whole, and in the world at large, that we will have global food security and a stable mother earth. Each of our countries needs to formulate and implement policies and technical support that empower local communities to that end. Most of you are younger than me and have many decades of life ahead of you. May you all and all your children and grandchildren and all future generations live in our Mother Earth, which has become stable because we have stabilized its component ecosystems. In the meantime, thank you all for hearing me through. Thank you very much, Devolde, for presenting your efforts and your success stories in land restoration in Tigray in the north of Ethiopia, and also making us aware that there's a very close link between social issues and soil degradation. Now, two questions. Who wants to be the first? The microphone is coming here. Thank you. My name is Eglin Tawia from Southern African Research and Documentation Center based in Zimbabwe. Mine is just a comment uh, uh, based on what has been presented that uh, there is a rich source of uh, traditional uh, knowledge and also scientific knowledge uh, on land and uh, soil management. But uh, the former traditional knowledge, it, uh, it is not well documented as much as the, 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 the letter. And yet there are so many similarities which should uh, be integrated for sustainable land management. And I would like to, to, to suggest or to recommend that uh, this, this soil week will have one of its action plan is uh, to, to support initiatives that would want to uh, have more documentation have more dissemination in traditional knowledge that it will be able to be integrated in the, in the whole system. Mm -hmm. And uh, that would then uh, help in the uh, policy making. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there another question? There are two questions here, and then we immediately go to the next. Yep. Here, and your neighbor, over. Um, my name is Andre Loy, and I'm the president of the International Federation of Organic Agricultural Movements. 
Sorry, is this on? Yes, it is. Okay, didn't sound like it to me. Firstly, uh, I think, Tavoldia, what you have done in Tigray is one of the, I suppose, the greatest success stories in the world as far as we're concerned. You've taken an area where people are actually dying from drought and lack of food and taken them into food security. And you've done it using local knowledge. You've done it with simple inputs like compost. I think the other one too is the issue of biogas where you're using the biomass to produce the energy instead of having to cut the wood and that provides light and uh, cooking. And for me, if we're talking about solutions, look to what they've done in Tigray. They've, they've done it for hundreds of thousands of people. They're expanding it around Ethiopia. But I believe that this is a model that can be expanded, for instance, for Lindiwe in Zimbabwe, but all of Africa, but Asia and Latin America. It is one of the great success stories of the world. And unfortunately, it's one of the best kept secrets. We need to get it out. And for me, Tavoldi, thank you so much for doing it. Thank you. Was there another question? Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Martin Rokitsky from Oxfam GB. Um, I'm, uh, I actually want to pass a question or um, uh, uh, make reference uh, to uh, the question of scaling up uh, many bilateral and multilateral donors and funds. They're, they're desperately uh, also asking NGOs of how can we scale up these local practices, technologies that you have uh, described that maybe have been uh, successfully applied in, in uh, many sort of, uh, I, I would say, rather smaller projects uh, in Tigray and other parts of Ethiopia. But given your vast knowledge, what do you think is the the biggest challenge in Ethiopia, for instance, for scaling those up and actually uh, have a, a high spatial coverage of these uh, technologies and practices. Okay, thanks a lot. Back to you, Devolde. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. The first two were merely encouraging comments. Uh, the, first quest, the first comment also had the sad implication of traditional knowledge not being recorded. Well, let's give the solution to the local community and traditional knowledge will continue alive. Scientific knowledge will become only an additional input and not a substitute. That would do both enable the traditional knowledge to survive until it is recorded and raise fertility and improve human life. The second is purely a comment and thank you very much is all I can say. The last, how can we upscale? Well, there has to be really a political will in each of our countries for upscaling. In Ethiopia, how it happened was very simple. It became clear that this, these isolated experiments were working and the extension system, which means the Ministry of Agriculture of the country as a whole, adopted them. And they have now become a means of improving food security throughout the country with the needed training for extension agents and model farmers. There is a lot of detail we could discuss. I don't think we can do it now, but any government that so decides will know that it will know what it should do to expand what it sees being done in a small locality and is good. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tevolde. And now I'm really happy to ask our friend Professor Young to take the floor. He is the president of the International Union of Soil Sciences 
representing thousands of soil scientists all over the world. Mm -hmm. And he is also a professor at of soil environmental chemistry at Kang Won National University of Korea. And of course, you are not presenting only the Korean perspective on this, but you are presenting the perspective of the soil scientists of the world. Thank okay, you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. It's great honor and privilege to be invited to this platform. And on behalf of IUSS members, congratulate having second Global Soil Week and wishing enormous uh, success in this week. And today I like to point out about the show about the soil value assessment process <clears throat> as a tool to convince police makers to take soil as a precious uh, resources. We keep saying soil, soils are very precious resources, but we don't know how much it will be. I, I think that's the important approach to convince politicians and so on and so forth. When I arrived at this hotel, Jess left a thank you card acknowledging for my coming to Global Soil Week and found out he listed all the keyword problems and questions as interwoven crossword puzzle like that. I think to give some answer for those kind of puzzles will be objective of this Global Soil Week. So in order to get some answer for those, we needed to get some, we needed to understand grand challenges what uh, left in, uh, in soil science and also sustainable soil management should be based on need from society and stakeholders. Soil security is kind of new form, new terminology developing in recent years, especially by Alex from Sydney University. And we have to provide basically not only food fiber and low material for shelters, but all food, food security, energy, water, climate, and biodiversity matters. So grand challenges are lying ahead of soil scientists. Uh, population explosion, as you know, like by two, 2050s, the food, protect, food production should be doubled, simply doubled, but we don't have enough land. And also this challenge is hindered by climate change, like competition for land and energy and water etc. There is not enough land in modern intensive agricultural era. Professor Lal pointed out in his paper that if our soil properly managed, we can produce enough food for current population and also for even future. Is it correct? And also we have to take care. A lot of society ask soil scientists for ecosystem well balanced with uh, health and economic functions, and also there are a lot of human nutrition malfunction problems due to soil degradation. In talking about societal need, there are, I can, my, this is my view, I can classify stakeholders into four groups. Soil scientists, like in IUSS, and farmers, public, and mostly pol policymaker, politician, and legislator, etc. There is uh, some story we need to talk about. Among these stakeholders, there exist, uh, they exist big war, like South and North Korea and East West Germany a while ago. We have to break this war in order to communicate properly, understand how soil is precious, and what kind of sustainable soil management protocol we, we should take into consideration. And the barrier, the height of those barriers are highest for between soil scientists and policymaker, politician, legislator, etc. Somehow we have to find solution to break, breaking these barriers. In, in Asia, like in, including Korea, we have a lot of precipitation. Land, lands are very limited with you know, highly populated 
uh, population densities. And also those precipitation you know, concentrate during monsoon season. Uh, I, like I say, from July to August sometimes. So we have a lot of soil degradation, <coughs> physical soil erosion, and as you can see, enormous gold erosion. So we have like, we are losing soils in Asia country too. We have to uh, find out a lot of solutions for doing that. So in order to uh, stress the importance of soil, what kind of tool will be efficient, most efficient? That's the uh, key thought we have. I think there are many methods are available, but the law or and or policy is the most efficient to convince a decision maker to take soil as precious resources. And Based on our soil scientist effort in Korea, we were successful to put into the law mandatory, uh, like conserve the topsoil, and we have to find out the proper soil uh, sustainable management, uh, soil management uh, protocols. And we cannot deal with most of entire land, but you know, to begin with, like the four major river area and riparian area and drinking water resources area soils are taking priority. In doing so, we take, take soils function as biomass production, protection of our environment and ecosystem services by considering many value, variables like that. So finally, we think surface soil is very precious resources. The last speaker always should hurry you know, to finish up every material. So we have, by two years ago, you know, in the soil, soil environment conservation law, we have to specify, we have to set proper sustainable soil management protocol in order to save our resources. So we set the goal of uh, sustainable soil management are first, erosion control, second, soil value assessment, and thirdly, pro propose holistic management protocols. So estimation how soil degradation. Based on national wide uh, database, we could build maps like this for eight different soil land use area. For example, in here, you can see a lot of like several hundred tons of soils eroded in, in uncovered bare soils. So officers approached me, joked that, can you reduce that number? Otherwise, I have too many works to do. I have to find out a lot of budgets to take care of the, those. So through this kind of work, we can provide which area it has the higher priority to conserve our resources. And then uh, secondly, we try to make, you know, assess the soil value in both quantitatively and qualitatively. So first quantitative, based on our national wide soil database, we, we build national wide soil quality assessment map using soil value indexes. In here, I give an example for soil pH and soil CEC. The left map is actual data. Based on that, we create the right map based on uh, soil quality for each individual variables. After that, we integrate all of them into some uh, map for soil quality assessment. And the second is the quantitative assessment. There are many, many methodologies available in the literature. And as you can see in here, so we estimate value of soil in Korea soil by considering uh, soil functions such as purification of organic waste, storage of water resources, reduction of carbon dioxide, and heritage value, etc. So totally, Korean soil value estimate about 30 US billion dollars. 
I don't know if that's expensive or not. But anyway, was, that money was big enough, I think, to convince our politician to make a law, law available for soil protection. And for the management option, we have to consider both soil degradation and soil value. For example, the group one, two, three, four should have different management options. So the soil locate, you know, classified into the group one is the high priority for management developments. So soil can be like new engine for new sustainable area in, in the 21st centuries. Like we keep keyword nexus and IUS hope to cooperate with the Global Soil Week and Global Soil Partnership to solve some sustainable soil management protocols. Thank you so much. And we will have um, more, more opportunity to discuss about soil degradation and soil, uh, sustainable soil management in next June in Korea, Jeju Island. Most of them should come to enjoy our nation. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation and also for the invitation to come to Korea. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> now, two questions. Yes, please, here and here. Thank you. Aren't you hungry? It's up to you. <laughs> <laughs> it's just a comment, really. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Therese Ott. I'm representing Richards Bay Minerals a mining company in South Africa, it's a Rio Tinto company. Just a comment, um, you m listed some stakeholders there. I think the one key one that you left off is industry and the important role that industry has to play in um, conserving soils and taking soils into account and the important role they play in terms of agriculture and human, uh, human development. Thank you. Okay, thank you, good and comment. The next question please, directly. Uh, Graciela Metternich from the University of New South Wales in Australia. Um, one quick question. Um, impressive presentation that you did on the way you could quantify soil ecosystem services in, in that way to convince politicians. What was the cost to your country of doing that? Because I refer your example to what Mr. Morales said about the problems in many South American and Latin American countries. The first stone in this road is usually the cost of producing such an estimation and politicians don't see a value on data because it cannot be shown as a poly in their political platform. Uh, constructing roads and good infrastructure shows more about your uh, achievements as a politician rather than having a good database of soils. Uh, so what was the cost of doing that exercise in your country? And, uh, and in, in a way to, to be able then to influence politicians in, in terms of le doing legislation? Well, I am not quite sure. I'm not quite sure about that. This is an answer you do not get very often from a scientist to say, <laughs> I, I'm not so quite sure. <laughs> Sorry about that, but I have to find out. <laughs> okay, so now, thanks a lot for your Thank presentation, you for answering the questions. I have two announcements to make. The first announcement is due to the fact that we have spent a little bit more time than planned. The afternoon sessions will start 15 minutes later, so 14 hours and 15 minutes, so that you have a little bit more time for uh, having lunch. Second announcement, I have received some questions while I was sitting there, can we deepen the debate? And of course we can, but not now. So deepening the debate is possible on Thursday because after the, the end of the Global Soil Week we have reserved Thursday for deepening the debate and there are several requests outside you will find uh, a place where you can put proposals on where you want to deepen the debate and therefore on Thursday it's possible to discuss a lot of the issues addressed today and also being addressed in the next days. And now I would like again to ask you for a round of applause for our participants and ask...
our friends from the Prinzessinnengarten, who equipped us with this lovely urban gardening experiment, taught me the famous term, what they call urban mining. And as a giveaway for uh, the panelists, what we did is an urban mining experiment. So these are the banners that we lose, used last year uh, to announce the Global Soil, and we had them reproduced into bags. And when you sort of take them, you will realize that there's quite a bit of stuff in there. This is recent IS publications because you know, as we all learned, the measure of success of science is producing kilos in terms of paper. <laughs> so enjoy your lunch. Thank you.